Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot, regularly flying long haul on Airbus A330 aircraft. And in today's video, we are going to have a look into navigating the North Atlantic. We're going to do this based on sample flight with the British Airways Boeing 787 from Horizon Simulations from London Heathrow over to Boston. And on this flight, we're going to have a careful look at the most important items you need to know. And I will also point out a couple of the differences between what is done in real life and what is done on VATSIM on the Cross the Pond event in order to give you the knowledge in a little bit more useful way for your VATSIM flying. All right, so let's go right into the cockpit of our 787. We have basically completed our pre-flight procedures and all our entries, and we are now going to have a look into the additional checks that we are doing to prepare for our North Atlantic and ETOPS flight. So let's first of all start with the general checks that we are going to do right over here. So we start with the pre-flight checks. The first thing of course is to check that the logbook shows that the pre-departure service check for the ETOPS flight if you are operating a two-engine aircraft has been carried out. We make sure that the RVSM equipment checks with which mostly means comparing the altimeter readings and verifying that they are within 50 feet of one another. Next up, you check that the clock is in GPS mode. This becomes very relevant because once we're out on the North Atlantic, we gotta make sure that we are actually running in the correct time. For your VATSIM flight, that means going on to the weather menu as well and checking that the real-time selector is turned on. All right, so let's turn that on right now. So then we can go on from there and we would carry out the HF radio check, making sure that our HF radios work. Now, unfortunately in the Horizon 787 we cannot do that, but here is how you would do it in real world. You would tune an HF frequency, then make sure that the speaker is turned on or you put on your headset, select uh, the transmit button and then just transmit on that HF frequency for a short period in time, say just click the push to talk key once. You will then hear a beep tone which indicates that the antenna is actually being tuned to the frequency in question. You do that with both HF radios, left and right, in order to verify that both are working. Next up we are going to go into the CPDLC menu. So we go on COM and then from there we make sure a couple of things. So first of all, make sure that the message log is deleted. So for example, in the 787 here, we go into review and we make sure that none of these contains any messages. Next up, we make sure that ADSC and auto position reports are armed and turned off respectively. So ADSC armed, auto position report off. And this is something that, depending on your add-on, may or may not work. For example, over here in the Horizon Sim, the position report page is completely turned off, so we do not even have the ability to do that in first place. So, with all of that done, we make sure that we did a full IRS alignment. Now, this one is important if you load the aircraft in a panel state which already has the IRS aligned. Turn it off, wait 30 seconds, realign it. The background behind that is that you really want to make sure that your IRS position at the start of the flight is as accurate as possible. We also compare the ground speed values here to make sure that we see zero while the airplane is stationary on both sides. Now, the ground speed is something that many flight simmers are not aware of, but in the real world, as the IRS starts drifting, your ground speed is going to slightly change. And at the end of a the flight, there can be differences of up to 10 knots in the ground speed indications on both sides after a long flight of about 10 hours. So this is really something that is a thing in the real world, since when you are flying over the North Atlantic, you are outside the reception range of reliable navigation aids for a long time, and therefore the IRS starts becoming a primary means of navigation should GPS come down. So the next check then is a little bit more useful for most flight simmers, and that is comparing the waypoints on your NUT HLA with the operational flight plan and the um, computer. So let's have a look into how we are going to do this. Now, in today's case, I'm going to use the Navigraph chart app in order to show our flight plan. So if we go into the flight menu over here, view the OFP, then we can see that we're filed over a North Atlantic track alpha over here. 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the track message and we are going to compare those waypoints. So track alpha is located just up here. And now we comp we'll compare this with what we have in the FMS. So let's go ahead and go forward to the waypoints in question. And we can see here they start at Mallet. So we've got Mallet, then we got 53 North, 20 West. And we do have that in here. Then we got 53 North, 30 West which we also have in here, 53 north, 40 west, which we have over here, and then 52 north, 50 west, which we also have, and thereafter, 2 dep and 2 dep Now, in the real world, you would also go ahead and cross-check the actual coordinates. Now, let me give you a little bit of detail for that, and then I'll give you some samples of how you can do that. So, in the flat plan over here, we can see 53 north, 20 west. And you can see that the very same has uplinked from Navigraph or from Simbrief. But how can we check that what we see here is actually what we require? Well, that's quite simple. We take the waypoint, we copy it out of the scratchpad and be very sure that you actually copy it and don't type it manually. Then you go to InnerDraft, Index, Nav Data, and you would insert it right up here. Unfortunately, in the Horizon Sim, this doesn't work, so I can't really show you how to do that in the real world on those examples, but nonetheless, I have an example waypoint for you over here, H5320, and that stands for 53 north and a half and 20 degrees west. Now, in the Horizon Sim, you can help yourself by going to the fixed page and inserting it over here, and you can see when I insert the waypoint over here, all of a sudden it writes the full coordinates. So like that, you can still check in the Horizon Sim that the coordinates are actually correct. And you would do that for every single one waypoint in question. So yes, that does mean a little bit of copy and paste, but it is part of the work of a long haul pilot. So here we got N53 West 30, copy and paste that. Here we go. Okay, is correct. Now we do that for the next waypoint, 5340. And like that, we'd have to copy and paste every single waypoint to cross check that the coordinates are entirely correct. Now, once we're in flight, we're going to get a little bit of additional checks that we have to do here. But for now, this shall suffice for our checking. So let's go on with the next item then. And the next item is actually quite simple. It's just making sure that your wind data is uplinked. So you go to the root page, wind data request, and you just verify that you actually got the wind over here like you can see we do. Okay, so with that, our data is uplinked. And that is all these specific checks that we would do on the ground. Now, in the air, there will be more checks to do, and we are going to skip forward a little bit now and have a look at those in flight. We're now up in the air and outside the immediate vicinity of our departure airport. Now, on a long-haul flight like this, crossing the North Atlantic, whenever you are outside the immediate vicinity of the airport, when your workload starts decreasing, that is a very good opportunity to start thinking oceanic clearance. Basically, the earlier you request it, the better it is for your flight. But there are a couple of uh, limits over there. So, on a flight like this, where we are entering the North Atlantic via the Shanwake control center, we basically need to request our clearance within 60 to 90 minutes after becoming or before entering the North Atlantic area. On VATSIM, however, they reduced that to 45 minutes. So they want you to make the request 45 minutes before you enter the North Atlantic area. The reason they did that is because when they used the 90 minute rule, a lot of pilots would just make their request, but submit an incorrect estimated time of arrival at the North Atlantic fix, or maybe the North or maybe the estimated time of arrival would just change occasionally because your airplane might not have done as accurate predictions or because the wind is slightly different from the forecast, you name it. However, they really want you to have that estimate for the North Atlantic entry as accurate as possible. And therefore, they want you to submit the request 45 minutes before entering the North Atlantic airspace on VATZIP. Now. In order to do that, we need to check when that is going to be. So our first oceanic fix we said earlier is going to be mallet. Now, if we go into the root data page over here, then we do get our estimated time of arrival for mallet. Again, make very sure that the wind has been inserted or uplinked so that the estimated time of arrival here is as accurate as possible. 
Now, they want us to make the clearance request 45 minutes prior, that means in our case at 1503. Now, let's go ahead and draw ourselves a little reminder for when to submit the clearance, and there is an easy way to do that. Now, in Airbus aircraft, you would just enter 1503 and just enter that on the flight plan page as a new waypoint, pretty much like this, 1503, and then just insert it somewhere over here. Obviously in the Boeing that is not going to work, but in the Boeing there is another possibility how to do that. And you can go onto the fixed page, then type 1503 Zulu and insert that down here. And when you do that, it is going to draw a visual reminder on your nav display for when you're going to reach that fix. Note that this is a feature of the larger Boeing, so the 777 or the 787. I'm not 100% sure about the 747, but in general, like this, you can draw a point on your navigation display at a certain time. So this now tells us 1503, here it is, and this serves as a good reminder for us that we need to submit our clearance by the time we get there. Now, talking about submitting the clearance request, there is a few things that we need to take care of, and we're going to deal with those in a few moments. But first of all, as we're still in the climb, we need to decide on our initial cruising altitude. Now, you can see over here, optimum is 370, maximum 399, so obviously we are just going to make it flight level um, 380, as that is close enough to the optimum. So 38 is going to be our good cruising altitude. Now, why am I mentioning it at this point? Mostly because the decision to accept a certain cruising altitude is a bit of a tactical one when you are considering North Atlantic flying. Now, the initial cruising altitude you are actually flying does not influence your oceanic request at all. So don't just accept the highest possible initial cruising altitude just because you think that might give you an advantage on the North Atlantic track. It does not. The requests are completely separate from one another. So just select the most optimal for your flight when you are climbing out and then the oceanic request is going to be something completely different to be done at a later point. However, the important point at this time in the flight is that you visualize when you need to submit your clearance request. Now the clearance request itself is going to be a different topic, so let's jump forward a little bit in the flight and let's start thinking about how our request is actually going to look like and what makes sense and what doesn't. So we've now reached our cruising altitude and we are slowly approaching the point where we want to make our clearance request. So let's go ahead and have a look into a couple of the things that we need to take care of when we are requesting our oceanic clearance. And for that we are going to have a look into our flight plan one more time and the first thing that we are going to check is the North Atlantic track message. And the track message is published daily and is given together with a so-called TMI number, that's the one you got down here, which basically confirms the number of the track message in question. Now, we know already that we are planned on North Atlantic Track Alpha, which we can find up here. We can see that the track is available not towards the east, but only when flying towards the west. What you will notice over there is the amount of different flight levels available and that they do not abide the standard separation rules. So you might very well fly onto an even or an odd level into the same direction on the North Atlantic. The exact levels available are published over here by our traffic control in the track message. So we can see that for our North Atlantic track Alpha, the available levels are 340, 350, 36, 37, 38 and 390. Above 390, track Alpha is not available. However, if you wanted, you could still fly the same routing of the track, but above the actual track. So even though you are filed on track alpha and the highest level available on that track is 390, you might still request flight level 400 and ATC would still clear you for it. Technically speaking, that means you will be flying on a random route, but in practical terms, that is something that's done a lot on aircraft that usually fly that high, like the 787, the A330 and so on. So now this is the first important piece of information for us. Now the next important one is the text that you got down here and that is really something that you should read of the track message every time you fly. The text often is similar to what it always looks like but there are some details in there that can really play a role. 
For example, down here we've got the send clearance request 90 to 30 minutes prior to Oceanic Entry Point, with 30 minutes being the latest point to send it. Then the track levels are uh, published over here and finally they want you to include the maximum level in the clearance request. If no maximum level is provided, the clearance request level will be considered as the highest acceptable flight level that can be maintained at the oceanic entry point. So this is an important piece of information over there. The rest of it we're going to talk about later, but with this in mind, let's go ahead and make our decision as to what flight level we want to accept for our flight. And for that, first of all, let's have a look at how to request, how to submit the clearance request. Now, on Vatsim, they use the NetTrack website. The link to that will be in your briefing package for the Cross the Pond flight. But let's also have a look at how it's done in the real world. NetTrack basically asks for these same pieces of information. So you go to the Com Manager flight information and then oceanic clearance request and over here is what we need to fill out for the clearance. So our facility as we're going to enter via Shenvik today is going to be Echo Golf Golf X-Ray. Now our entry point is the point where we join the North Atlantic track and we said already that this is going to be Mallet. So we need to take Mallet and put that in here. So Mallet entry point. Now comes the flight level, and this is a bit of a tactical decision that you have to make as a pilot. So, generally, you cannot rely on getting step climbs while you're on the North Atlantic tracks. Therefore, what you should take into consideration is what is the highest level you can achieve when entering the track. Remember, you will be flying on the track for several hours. Normally, we're talking about three and a half to four and a half hours on the North Atlantic track. It might be longer if you're flying on one of these southerly tracks. So choose your requested level wisely. Today we've got an optimum of flight level 372 at the present position. We got approximately one hour to fly until our North Atlantic track entry. Now there are some rules of thumbs. These are different for every aircraft type but for the 787 and the 777, we can say that every 10 minutes of flight, the optimum level increases by about 100 feet in altitude. So, knowing that we have about one hour to fly till our North Atlantic track entry, we can say that our optimum and maximum are going to increase by approximately 600 feet. That means the optimum is going to be close to flight level 380, the maximum is going to be just below flight level 410. So, since we now need to decide on the flight level that we want to fly on the North Atlantic track and taking into account that chances are that we might not get a level change en route, personally I would do the following. So our optimum we just set is going to be flight level 378 by the time we reach our track entry. Knowing that we're flying on the track for 4 hours, that is 240 minutes, so we're looking at 20. 400 feet altitude increase in the optimum while we're on the track so therefore I would say even though the most optimal the, the most commercial level at the time we enter the track is 380 I would probably go ahead and request flight level 390 since that is going to provide the best average for the entire time that we're flying on the North Atlantic track in the real world there is a couple more factors that you take into account over here. Most importantly, the thing that in the real world, chances are that you will get a step climb while you're on the net. So in the real world, if my optimum is just shy of level 380, I would go for flight level 380. On Vatsim, however, especially on an event like the Cross the Pond, chances are you might not get such a step climb. You can, of course, try. Nothing pr prohibits you from trying. But nonetheless, we just want to be on the safe side. So today I would go ahead with the reasoning that I gave earlier and request flight level 390 as my oceanic flight level. The ETA is the time at which we are going to arrive at our entry point. So in this case over at Mallet. And this is going to be 1550 as we can see in here. So 1550 is going to be our ETA. And make sure that you always insert this as UTC time. Especially if your simulator is not running in real time because you might have changed it to a night flight, to an early morning flight or whatever it is, then be very sure that you correct this to the correct UTC real world time. 
Next up comes the Mach number. Now the Mach number is easy. We simply take what the plane has calculated as optimum. So with our conditions today, we can see that it plans for approximately 0.85. So 0.85 is what we're going to enter over here. In the real world, you can just enter 0 0.85. Let's just see what format it needs over here. Doesn't take that either. Okay, well, then we just do 8.5. Okay. And finally, we've got the free text down here. The free text is where you're going to enter your maximum flight level and if you're flying on the North Atlantic track, the TMI number. So, we said earlier that our maximum level is going to increase by 600 feet until we actually join the track. That means 408 is going to be the maximum. Obviously we cannot fly 408 as the next higher available level would be 410. So for that reason we are going to enter flight level 400 as the maximum acceptable level. And be aware of the format. You must enter this as F400. Not FL, not just 400, not 40,000. F and then the three digits for the flight level. So F400. And then we also need to include our TMI number since we are flying on the North Atlantic track. And the TMI we get out of the track message. So if we go back into the charts, you can see over here TMI is 107. When you're flying across the pond, you're going to get a customized briefing package which is going to include a TMI number as well. So be sure to enter that. So in our case over here, we already set flight level 400. We have inserted a space sign. And then we can say TMI. 107 include that as free text and now all we got to do is wait until we reach the point in time that we have previously calculated and we have just reached that so we can now send out the clearance request and that's going to be it now in the real world you will typically get a reply within a matter of seconds that is going to say something like rcl received if no reply within a certain amount of time usually that's 15 minutes for um, Shanwick, if no reply with received within 15 minutes, contact delivery by voice. And if if we don't get the clearance on time, then then we got to contact delivery on voice. Now, talking about VATSIM again, then in case you are flying along and you are at some point going to enter your um, North Atlantic track, but you have not received your clearance yet, by what time you sh should you start getting nervous? Well. It is not allowed to enter the North Atlantic high-level airspace without clearance. So, by the time we pass our nut entry point, Mallet in our case, we need to have clearance on board. We absolutely need to have it. Without it, we would not cross Mallet. We would arrange a delay with air traffic control, etc. But the important point here is, when should you start getting nervous if your clearance has not been received yet? Well, personally, I would start getting nervous about 15 minutes prior to the oceanic entry point and if nothing has been received at that point call the oceanic delivery controller via vhf radios and arrange something with them in the real world as i mentioned you are going to be provided with the time frame within which you need to request your clearance in order to actually um in order to actually have a better idea all right then so Let's now move forward a little bit to a point where we are going to receive our clearance and then we'll have a look at what that might look like and what to do with it. So a little bit of time has passed and we have now gotten our oceanic clearance. And here it is. So before we are going to continue working with this, however, we got a little bit of a checklist to work through in order to make sure that our airplane is completely prepared for the flight. So let's just put the clearance away again for a second and we'll start with the checklist right from the top. So the first thing we've got to ensure before we are entering any oceanic airspace is that our aircraft is actually compliant. So that means we need to fulfill a certain minimum navigation accuracy. can easily check that down here on the ANP 0.02. Fine. Now Next up, we are going to check for the RVSM altimeter and equipment. So again, make sure that all your altimeters read within the same um, amount. They have to be within 200 feet from one another. Next up, we are going to lock on CPDLC for our oceanic controller. And 
The way we do this is we go onto the com page, then onto ATC, lock on status, and then we choose the station in question. And so in our case, that's going to be Echo Golf Golf X-Ray. All right, lock on, and you need to do this about 20 minutes prior to entry. You can do it a little bit earlier and just send the lock on. If you're already locked on with another CPDLC station earlier, then you don't need to send the lock on request again. It's going to be completely fine to um, just be locked on with the current station because the entire system is automatically going to notify the next station down the line. Okay then, so from here we are now going to go right into our oceanic clearance and what to do with it. So let's have a look at the clearance and what we actually got now. So us, Speedboat 5 Delta Bravo, is cleared to Boston via Nut Track Alpha. Then we got all the waypoints down here, and even though we already have seen Nut Track Alpha up here, we still cross-check those waypoints, so we still go over them one by one, comparing them with the operational flight plan in order to make sure that it's actually really the same. Like, there is a small chance that you might have gotten an out-of-date track message and the it might not have been uh, noticed during your clearance request. So we really go over this very, very carefully in order to ensure that we have exactly what we need. So let's just give this a quick look. Okay, so cleared via Mallet 53 North 20 West, and that is what we have down here, 5320. Then via 5330, and we've got 5330. Then 5340, and we have 5340. Then we continue via 5250, and in here 5250, and finally TUDAP, and we got TUDAP. Okay, so, then, now that this has been verified, we can go on with our um, checks. So the next thing is, from Mallet, at time 1550, maintain flight level 390, mark 0.85. Now, very important. This, maintain flight level 390, is not an ATC clearance for an immediate climb. This is only from your oceanic entry. It is up to you as the pilot to verify that you get to this flight level before you're going to enter the North Atlantic track. So before Mallet, we have to be in flight level 390. When you are going to climb is completely up to you. You just got to make sure that you will be at flight level 390 at Mallet. Now, obviously, domestic ATC is going to be very interested in getting you up to the level as early as possible in order to reduce their own workload. So, what are we going to do? Well, usually by the time you get in contact with Shannon Air Traffic Control, they will ask you for your oceanic cleared level because they may or may not be able to see it. They might not know which oceanic level you've been cleared to. So they might ask you for it and usually they will ask you if you want to climb right away or if you want to delay the climb a little bit but often they just clear you up straight away so seeing that the Shannon FIR is rather big and you might not be able to obtain your level by mallet if they do give you an early clearance you might just about tell them that you're unable to climb yet and when about you will be able to climb but remember it is your responsibility that you reach the oceanic level at the oceanic entry point Next up then is the time. So we said that we gotta reach Mallet over here at 1550 UTC. And that is something that you as a pilot again are responsible to meet. So keep a good eye on the estimated time of arrival at that waypoint. Do note that many aircraft do not give you a correct ETA on the navigation display. So yes, you do have an ETA up here, but it might not be reliable. The reason behind that is that the ETA over here is usually calculated using the current wind and not the wind that, that you might have somewhere over here. So if you're flying a long direct, then always use the time from your FMS. Basically not only when flying a long direct, but especially then because the number you see up on the ND might be incorrect. So just always keep an eye on it using your FMS. Now you can see we've been cleared for 1550 Zulu. But we're actually going to be there at 1549er. Is that a problem? No. Why is that not a problem? Because the time deviation that you're allowed to have 
is plus minus two minutes around the estimated time of arrival. So you've got 1549er in here, but your clearance is 1550. No problem. You can be there at 1548. You can be there at 1552, but no earlier and no later than that. Now, what is rather handy to know often is the exact time at what you will be there, including the seconds. And in the real world, you got a little bit of a trick there. If you have a look at the RTA page, unfortunately that's not available here in the horizon, but if you got the RTA progress page, on that one you are typically going to get the exact number, including the seconds, over which you are going to be there. So let's say, for example, that we had 15. Oh, sorry, 1548 in here, then I would be very interested whether that is 1548.9, so towards the end of that time, or 0.1, so till the beginning of the time. And that might help you in your decision making. All right, so now we have understood the clearance, so let's now go ahead and enter it into the FMS. So we are cleared with Mach 0.85, so we're going to go 0.85. We are cleared at flight level 390, so let's make it a restriction to be at flight level 390 at the net entry point. In this case, we can mark such a climb by adding an S in the um, Boeing 787, in the 777 and the 747. So like that, we are now going to insert the restriction we've gotten from ATC over here. Now the real one would continue at Mach 0.85 at the waypoints below. In the horizon zoom, it's unfortunately a bug that it doesn't do that. All right, and like that, you are going to enter your clearance. Now, from here on, we have now cross-checked and revised our FMS to be exactly in line with the required clearance. But that is not where things stop. So we got one more measure in order to make sure that our navigation is actually going to be accurate. So I told you on the ground already that we have cross-checked all the coordinates of the waypoints. But to add one more layer of safety, we are now going to do a track and distance cross-check between our waypoints and the OFP. So let's just bring the OFP right back up over here and I'm going to show you how to do this. So here's our flight plan, so let's go right into it. Now we can see that from Mallet 253 North 20 West the FMS predicts us on track 278 with 180 nautical miles if we now look into the plan we can see that in order to get from Mallet to 5320 it's a track of 271 with 181 nautical miles now why is there a difference well the track that you get on the FMS is usually the initial track from leaving the waypoint. But since we're talking long distances over here, there is a difference between the great circle track, which is usually going to be shown in your flight plan, and the initial track that is going to be shown on the FMS. That is why there can be a difference. Also note that many flight plan formats are going to give you the tracks in the flight plan as true tracks and not as magnetic tracks. So if your aircraft is equipped with a function to switch between magnetic and true heading, then by all means do use that function for the cross check. So on the 787 we got the button up here, but it's unfortunately not simulated. So we got to stick with the magnetic tracks that we have over here. So some sort of a difference in the heading can be expected. In the real world, three or four degrees of difference is the norm because of the effects that I talked about earlier with the um, Earth curvature and initial versus great circle tracks. But there are tables available in the manuals through which you can cross-check. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any such table for flight simulation, so we just got to live with a rough match in the track, like we have it here, 271 versus 278, that is okay but the distance should be within one or two nautical miles. So 180 miles towards 53.20, and in here we got 180 miles towards 53.20. Then we move on from there to 53.30, and for that one, we can see the track should be 273, 361 nautical miles. So in here we got 282, 361 nautical miles. That's okay given the um, previous track limitation, which applies all over. Then, looking at the track 
towards 40 west. We're looking at 273. Again, 361 miles. In here, we've got 286, 361 miles. Now, that 286 is definitely incorrect. I'm not sure why the Horizon Sim is modeling that. Something like 273 looks perfectly fine, seeing that we are staying on the same latitude. So, the OFP is correct over here. The FMS, unfortunately, is not. Buck in the horizon. Don't worry about it. But question the tracks that you see. You might have an incorrect waypoint in here. For example, instead of 53 north, 40 west, you might be flying to 53 and a half north, 40 west. And that might explain the track difference. So careful cross-checking there is required. If I saw a difference like this in my flight plan, I would now go ahead and cross-check again that the um, coordinates of the waypoints are correct. All right, so, and the mileage is correct over here as well. Then we go on towards 50 west, 264, 370 miles. You can see again in here, the track doesn't really make sense. The distance, however, does. And then we are going towards Tudep, which is where we leave the net. And that's 248, 131 miles. And we can see again, track doesn't match, but the distance does. Now, again, if you're using a study level add-on for your flight, the tracks should match as well. But within 3 to 4 degrees, due to the difference between initial track that's usually shown on the um, plan versus true or average track on the FMS, depending on your airplane type. So like this, we've now cross-checked that everything is indeed correct. Now, from there on, the next thing we have to check before we are allowed to enter the North Atlantic airspace is related towards our ETOPS area. So let's go ahead and have a little cross-check in that as well, in that we need to fetch our weather. So when we're talking about fetching weather, obviously we're also talking about the available alternates for your flight. Now, if we do have a look into our flight plan, then we will quickly notice that there are a couple of alternates which are planned along the route anyway. For example, down here, if we look into the ETOP summary section, we can see that our entry is planned via Shannon, our exit is St. John's, and then our ETOPS alternates are based on Nock and Keflavik. But which alternates are usually available along the North Atlantic? Well, let's have a look. I marked them for you on the um, chart over here. So this is the um, North Atlantic high-level airspace, and we are talking about... Um, the bird control area that we have up here, including Greenland. Then we go down to Shannon, Gander, Santa Maria, and New York. And then obviously we're getting into the um, mid-Atlantic down here, which has another several different areas. But the ones that we are going to focus on today are those four over here. Now, what are typical alternate airports available along the North Atlantic then? Well, on the eastern side, the primary alternate that is used for most flights is actually Shannon, Echo India, November, November. And then going up to, to the north, you've got Keflavik in uh, Iceland. On Greenland, there are a couple airports which, however, should be regarded as emergency use only. So when we go down here, then we do have Sondrostromfjord, we do have Nasaswak. But those are airports which you might be able to get into if your plane is burning. But first of all, there is not a lot of equipment available. There are not many hospitals. There is no engineering. And the runways are very short. So it is questionable whether your airplane can actually get out of there again. By all means, if you're on fire, go in there. But if you do have options, avoid Greenland as much as possible. If we go a little bit further to the south, we can see that we've got the Azores Islands. So there is um, Lachas right over here, which is a former military airfield. Very good equipment available. And then you've got Santa Maria down here, which is also a well-equipped airport for use. When we're getting over to the western side of the Atlantic then, then you've got quite a lot of airports located in Newfoundland and then a little bit further north along the coastline of um, Canada. Things are getting a little bit sparse again. But Generally, we do have three airports that are typically used over here. So that's St. John's, Gander, and Goose Bay. Now, if you ever try to call Goose Bay and don't get an answer on the radio, don't say, talk to me, Goose. They know that joke already. But generally, weather conditions in Canada are in a way that either the north is bad and the south is good, 
or the south is bad and the north is good. So, like that, if you are wondering about your um, weather, if either doesn't, doesn't work, try the others. Chances are one of the three is going to be good and enable you to get across the pond. But if actually all three are bad, then a little bit further inland you got Stephenville, which is a good eat alternate as well. And then a little bit further westbound you have Halifax. Halifax is usually not that good in terms of weather, but it is a very well equipped airport that you handles long haul passenger traffic on a regular basis. So those are the airports that you have available on the Canadian side. Now if you are flying a little bit further northbound, you've got Ilaquit up here, which is not a very well suited airport, but it is within the legal limits, so you can use that as an ETOPS alternate in order to make your crossing up north over here. Now, from Ilaquit, then usually there is Churchill over here, but Churchill is not very well equipped, so that's really only an emergency use um, airport. And then over here you are already running into the likes of um, Yellowknife, Edmonton, and so on, so usually. Edmonton or Yellowknife together with Ilaquit is, are the airports that you use to cover the area on the um, Labrador Sea up here in uh, northern Canada. But as mentioned, the airports we have available on our Atlantic crossing usually are um, Keflavik, Shannon, then you've got the Azores, and then you got the Newfoundland um, airports that you have over here. From those you are usually going to pick your um, ETOPS alternates. Now we just got a fuel low center message over here, so let's go ahead and turn off the center fuel pumps. And now we can go ahead and decide on the airports we want. Now, if we have a look into our operational flight plan, you will of course see that our dispatch has already done some calculations for us. So they have calculated our equal time points based on NOC and Keflavik. Now, those must not necessarily be the most optimal waypoints for your flight but those are just some fitting airports that your operational that your um, ops controllers have chosen so let's go ahead and have a look into which ones we might want to choose then for our flight while we're en route now generally shannon is a very good option so shannon is always something to consider Especially since it's just located very well on the uh, shore of Ireland over here and it's usually suits most of the North Atlantic westbound and eastbound tracks available. So Shannon is definitely something we are going to take. Now going on from there we are going to um, be moving across and we are approximately right in the middle between the Azores and between Iceland. So why, why not just request both of those in order just to have some options available. So let's go Bravo India Kilo Foxtrot. And we also want Lima Papa Lima Alpha. And then on the other side of the pond, well, either is going to work. So let's start by requesting um, St. John's down here, Charlie Yankee Yankee Tango. And if that one is bad, then we can still check the others. Now, very important when you make your weather request is that you not only look at how the weather looks like right now, but we actually look at what is the weather going to look like by the time we get to these airports. So don't just request the meta, but actually request the meta and the TAF. That's the important thing here. You want to look into the future. So we're going to send our request for um, the meta and the TAF. All right, so sending this one out. And now we got to wait until our weather arrives. This might take a little while since requesting many airports at the same time. In the real world, sometimes takes three or four minutes Looks like we are lucky over here, so we're actually getting our weather a lot quicker. Okay then, let's have a look. So, we've got Shannon, which is showing very good weather at the moment, and if we look into the forecast, we can see that temporarily 320 at 15 gust 25 light showers of rain. Now that's perfectly acceptable within our operational limits, so... And that is going to stop in the next 20 minutes. You always add an hour extra to that, so we're looking good in terms of uh, Shannon and we can use that. Now, when an airport is considered suitable, I would recommend to somehow mark it on the displays. Now, in Boeing aircraft, people are still using rings for that a lot of time. So, 410 miles, that's our certified one engine interoperative speed, so that is what we're going to use over here in order to mark that first 
airport. Now then we've got um, Keflavik, and Keflavik is currently showing very good weather, but now let's think for a moment, at what time are we actually going to arrive there? Well, for that we can use our alternate page, so Bravo India Kilo Foxtrot. If we enter that, we do get an estimated time of arrival. And we just got to keep in mind that we might actually fly past that point and come back to it, so always add a little bit to that. In the real world, you would get the earliest and the latest time of arrival at an airport through your flight plan for the airports that dispatch has calculated. For us, today, things might be a little bit different in that um, we just gotta make something up since we're on the flight already and since we're not necessarily only checking those alternate airports that dispatch has calculated. So, if it says 1717 up here, then if we just take an additional two hours on that and then maybe round it up, so if we look at the weather until 20... UTC, then um, we should be good to know if we can use the airport or not. So, over here we've got weather becoming from 1800 UTC, so we've got to look even earlier. So, our general conditions are good, as we can see over here. Then it's becoming 140 at 15 light snow and rain, broken clouds, and then temporarily from 1900 onwards, 3000 meters snow and rain, broken 800. That's well within limits of what the plane can fly, so we can deem Keflavik suitable. Moving further down then to the next one, we can enter that as well. So for for um, Loches, over here, 1754 is what the plane estimates. And from there on, 1754, so we can roughly use the same time. So if we have a look at the weather down here, we can see that there is a tempo weather forecast of 150 at 15, gust 30 with thunderstorms. So... Personally, I would not consider Laches a good airport for us today. But as we got the alternative in the north with Keflavik, we are well covered. Now from there on, we can go on with the next one as we are still pending the weather from... as we're still pending the weather from um, St. John's. Now it looks like over here we cannot really show that. Obviously in the real world you could just print it out, the printer would give you the data and then you'd be able to see it all. In here it looks like we don't have that available, so let's just go ahead and request a bit more weather. So we've got Charlie, Yankee, Yankee, Tango, and if we're on it already, let's just request another two more. So Charlie, Yankee, Quebec, X-Ray, and then maybe Stephenville as well, Charlie, Yankee, Juliet, Tango. Okay, so let's go ahead and request those. Again, Meta plus forecast, and send that request out. And then we should hopefully get the weather in a few moments to verify that the other side of the pond is good as well. Okay, request a send, so we should get the weather in a moment, and here it comes. So, here we go. Lovely weather over here on this side of the Atlantic. But let's have a look at uh, what we actually have. So, St. John's over here is reporting gusty winds, and when looking at those winds, you always got to remember that in a METAR, the wind is reported in true, but the runway heading is magnetic. So when you're looking at the chart and when, you, when you're now considering if the alternate is suitable, then let's have a look at um, let's have a look at the Navigraph app once more in order to show you something that really any North Atlantic pilot should be aware of. So over here in uh, Newfoundland and in and generally on the Canadian Atlantic coast, we are generally looking at approximately 20 degrees of magnetic variation to the west. So let's have a look now. We'll take St. John's over here, open the chart, and when we go onto the approach page, you can see we've got lots of uh, runways available, lots of airports, but let's have a look. So we are generally looking at only runway 28 or runway 10 over here. So looking into the weather forecast now, we're looking at wind 210 at 13, gust 21. And in order to determine whether the crosswind is within limits now, we've got to remember one thing. Based on this, we can say runway 28 is our runway of choice. So if we go down here, ILS runway 28, then we are going to find the um, magnetic variation right on the chart. Or at least we should. Looks like on Japan it's not available everywhere. On the Lido charts that we're using in my company, it would be available right on here. So let's just see. There should be different sources available for that kind of info. So if you go onto the airport chart, there might be some 
magnetic variation indicated over here. Here it is. So as you can see, 17 degrees variation to the west. That means west always means at something. So when we're looking at the wind over here, 210 at 13 gust 21, then we got to add those 17 degrees to it. So the wind is actually going to come from 230 degrees instead of 210 degrees. So when you're calculating crosswind component, always take that into account. And now somebody tell me why the Jefferson guys don't include that information right on the approach chart, which is where it would be most handy. But well, so be it. Okay, so now let's look at the forecast again. So Charlie Yankee Yankee Tango, when are we going to arrive there? 1904. So for 1904, we need to determine the weather an hour earlier and an hour after. And looking at that now, 1904, so we're looking at weather from 1400. Then down here we got from 2000. So we've got to look at both weather conditions. So in here, from 1400, we're looking generally at good weather. And then during our time of arrival, we're looking at overcast clouds in uh, 700 with some light drizzle and... Um, five miles of visibility so generally good conditions so we can use st john's as an alternate so let's go ahead and add that to the um, fix page as well why can we not copy this okay so fix charlie yankee yankee tango that was one too many here we go we're going to add that on the second fix page here as well with a 410 mile ring now that is basically our um, that is basically our planning now done, and now we can go ahead and add the equal time point as well. So for the equal time point, we have to rely on what dispatch gives us if we are flying a Boeing. If we are flying an Airbus, then the Airbus has an ETP page, which I explained in a dedicated video already, where you can get all of that information more or less live. So for us. Suffice to say that we just need to create a waypoint for the ETP. In the real world, we would go index, nav data, and then just enter a new waypoint over here. Unfortunately, in the simulator, that doesn't work, so we just got to work off the coordinates. So we got north 5303.4, and 5303.4, and west is going to be uh, 028.24.9. So, 028.24.9. Okay, going to enter that up here. And that is our equal time point now between what dispatch has calculated. So, NOC and Keflavik. We need to be aware of that point. We don't necessarily actually need to use it. So, you can see right over here is where it is. Okay, so, with that we've now verified that all the airports are adequate. And our ETP is also set. And that basically summarizes what we do in order to prepare the entry. And as you can see, this just took us almost 250 nautical miles to do. So if anybody now still tells me that flying long haul would be boring, then all I'm going to respond is, yeah, of course it is. We do nothing else but letting the airplane fly on autopilot without doing any actual work. All right, and that now is what we do in order to prepare ourselves for the North Atlantic entry. So what's going to happen next is at some point within, you know, 30, 50 nautical miles of the North Atlantic entry point, we are going to pre be provided with the frequencies of our oceanic controllers. So let's go ahead and have a look at that now. Alright, so we're approaching our North Atlantic entry. We have not climbed to our cruising level yet, so let's go ahead and make sure that we reach that level by mallet. But remember, we need to get ATC clearance from the domestic controller in order to climb. The Atlantic clearance, which said maintain level 390 from mallet, is not a clearance to climb. You need to ask air traffic control for this. So let's say that we requested our step climb now. The clearance has been granted from our traffic control, so we are going to start our climb up to level 390. Also, have another look at the estimated time of arrival at your waypoint. That's a thousand ago. And we can see we're now still at 1549 UTC. And you can see that this can be different from what you've got on the nav display. If in doubt, 
the FMS always has priority. Always. Okay, great. So, with that, we have now prepared ourselves for the entry. So now let's go ahead and talk about the actual entry procedure. So, once everything is in order and once we comply with our North Atlantic clearance, we are and we are just shy of our oceanic entry, we are going to be provided with the first frequency of the oceanic controller. And here is the difference between VATSIM and the real world. In the real world, the oceanic controllers are going to use HF frequencies, while on VATSIM they use VHF frequencies. That means on VATSIM you might get something like 124.85, while in the real world HF frequencies are either four or five digits without a decimal in between. So for example, um, 4650 might be an HF frequency of a controller. So in the real world, they would tell you something like um, radar service terminated, contact Shanwick 4570. And they might tell you secondary frequency as well. Generally, what we do when we get those frequencies is we write them down. And if we get a secondary frequency, we'd also write that down. Might look something like this initially, because there will be lots of numbers to remember. Now, when, when you make contact with the Oceanic Controller, there's two things to be aware of. First of all, you tune the HF frequency and you just press the push to talk once for a second and that tunes the antenna to the frequency. If you don't do that and you start talking straight away, they will simply not be able to hear you. You might be able to hear them, but they can't hear you. So, now, how is the initial call to the Oceanic Controller going to look like then? Well, that's rather simple. The station that's being called, your own call sign, cell call check, and which sector is next. And that is all you say. There are many myths in the flight sim world that you would go for something like Shanwick, Shanwick, Speedbird 5, Delta Bravo, position report. No, don't do that. You also don't say the frequency on which you are calling. That's something that is rather widespread among pilots in the real world even, because it used to be standard operating procedure, but it is no more. So, if somebody tells you to call them saying something like Chanwick, Chanwick, Speedbird, 5 Delta Bravo, Heavy, calling on 2-4, then no. That is outdated, that is not being done anymore. The way the, the initial call is done is quite simple. Chanwick Radio, Speedbird, 5 Delta Bravo, Cell Call Check, Gander Next. And that's it. That's what you say. And in response, the controller is going to say something like this. Speedbird 5 Delta Bravo, my secondary frequency H906, at 30 West, contact Gander, primary 5550, secondary. 4512. So generally, the Oceanic Controller is going to give you their secondary frequency. He is going to state that the cell call check is coming up, and he is going to tell you when to and where to contact the next controller on which frequency. So if we have a look at the North Atlantic chart one more time. then you will easily be able to see how the oceanic airspace is made up. So we've got Shanwick over here, and at 30 west there is the boundary between Shanwick and Gander. And this is what you will encounter on most North Atlantic tracks. But there is also at 45 degrees north the boundary between the northern two and the southern two centers. So you've got Shanwick and Gander covering the north, and then you've got Santa Maria and New York covering the south. And the boundary is at 45 degrees north. And then you've got the boundary between New York and Santa Maria, located at um, 40 degrees west. My apologies for having to look that one up, but don't fly through this too often. So the boundary is located at uh, 40 degrees west, between those two. Now, there might be routings that might take you across something like this. But you always need to tell the controller which 
freaking or which sector is next and not which one is subsequent even if you just cross one of those sectors for only a very few miles let's say if you flew from shanwick through just the tiny gap here down in Ganda, down to Santa Maria, you still tell them Ganda next. So in our case, we're coming from Shanwick, we're going into Ganda, so our initial call is Shanwick Radio, Speedbird, 5 Delta Bravo, cell call check, Ganda next. The reason we need to tell the controller about which frequency is next is because we're not talking to the controller, but to a radio operator. So you've got the controllers sitting in their control centers, but the relax but the messages they say are going to be relayed through radio operators. So you're not directly talking to air traffic controllers and the radio operators might not know which exact flight plan you're following. All they do is to relay the messages, but they know all the frequencies of all the controllers. So therefore, when you tell them which sector is next, they will be able to tell you which frequency is going to be next. So again, the call you make is Shanghai Radio, Speedbird, 5 Delta Bravo, cell call check, Gander next. Now the controller responds with a bit of information, so when you make that initial call, be ready to write something down. And the answer is going to be, first of all, his secondary frequency, and then when to contact the other controller on which frequencies. So, in this case, we're going something like this. Speedbird, 5 Delta Bravo, Secondary frequency 8906 at 30 west, contact Ganda frequency primary 5550, secondary 4512. Don't read it back just yet. Wait for the cell call track. If you hear the obligatory ding dong, then you can start your read back by going Speedbird 5 Delta Bravo, cell call OK, your secondary 8906 at 30 west. Contact Gander, primary 5550, secondary 4512. And in most cases, the radio operators on the Oceanic Control Centers are just going to respond to that with a call sign, so something like Shanwake, or Gander, or you name it, wherever you are calling. All right, and that is pretty much it. Be sure to write those frequencies down, and with that, you are now Oceanic. Now, once you have gotten Oceanic, Oceanic, there's a few things that we should be aware of. The first one is the Strategic Lateral Offset Procedure, or in short, SLOP, S-L-O-P. Now, SLOP is advised to be carried out whenever reasonably possible. What do I mean with that? Well, let's quickly visualize what we're going to do in 99% of emergencies over the Atlantic. We need to lose altitude because we are flying at altitudes where we are not able to maintain the altitude single engine and we have therefore to descend. Now usually that is done by proceeding five miles right off track and then you start your descent. The offset is done so that you don't accidentally run into anybody that's flying right below you. So. Now we got to make a strategic decision. That's why it's called strategic lateral offset. Have a look at the traffic around you and also take into account who's slightly in front of you, who's slightly behind you. You might be flying different speeds, so the one behind you might be catching up or you might be catching up on the one behind, you name it. And then make a decision if you want to fly off track. So let's say that we had an airplane flying exactly below us, offsetting one mile to the right. Now we got to ask ourselves, if we are to start our emergency descent and we offset, or we now start offsetting to the right as well, then chances are we might be running into the other guy. So if you've got a guy, uh, one mile offset just below you, to the right, then you are going to go maybe two miles offset, so that you can just go out to the right and don't have, don't have any problems. Now if the guy in front of you is just flying exactly on the center line, then you might just go one mile off track or two miles off track. Up to the pilot, you have to decide that. But in any case, what is important to notice is that you only use the strategic lateral offset procedure if your airplane's FMS is capable of flying it. So, what does that mean? Well, you can see in the horizon zone over here, offset is grayed out. You can't do it. You might also find the prompt on the route page down here. Depends on your FMS. 
If you're flying Airbus, you'll find it on the flight plan page if you go to the lateral revision of the from waypoint. But if your FMS is not capable of flying offset, don't do it. It is not a requirement to go offset. It is an encouragement to call it like that. So, with that now taken into account, you decide whether you want to fly off track or not. Since our airplane, since the Horizon Zim today doesn't support off track, we cannot go off track. So we remember on the center line. If you go off track, it's always to the right, never to the left. Always offset to the right. The reason behind that is quite simple. Most routes on the North Atlantic, if you're not flying the NATs, are not one-way routes. And ATC clears aircraft onto any possible flight level. So even if we were not flying on a North Atlantic track, and even though we're going westbound, we might get a clearance to an odd flight level. So if we assume for a second that we are not on a North Atlantic track right now, but that we are actually flying on a random route, then we might still be in flight level 390. And if somebody is flying opposite and air traffic control has messed up the separation, they might also be in 390. So we are not protected like we are usually in radar covered airspace. Therefore, always offset to the right. If somebody is coming opposite direction, he will also be offset to the right and that gives you separation and prevents a collision. Alrighty, and that is the main point that we have on entering the North Atlantic tracks. Now, quick thing over here, in terms of how to fly the track. You can see that our FMS is defaulting to fly Mach 0.849, but our clearance is for Mach 0.85. Do not let it do this. Force it to fly the exact Mach number. So in our case, I'm going to force it to fly Mach 0.85 right over here. And that is what you need to do. Don't accept that the FMS is roughly giving you the target speed. Fly it exactly and precisely. There is a chance that air traffic control might tell you to resume normal speed. That, that order is issued when there is no conflicting traffic immediately on the minimum separation that ATC needs to provide. So you might get a resume normal speed from air traffic control. If you get that, you can go back to Econ speed, like so, but you must maintain within 0.02 Mach of your clearance. So let's say we are cleared to Mach 0.85 or we have filed Mach 0.85 on the flight plan, then we need to maintain between Mach 0.87 and Mach 0.83. If you deviate more than that, you need clearance from air traffic control in order to do it. So, now that we have talked about all the basics of flying Atlantic, let's have a little look into some of the features that we might experience while we are en route. So, let's now have a look at a couple of the features that we might experience en route. Now, first of all, let's talk about communications. Now, Communications are done primarily through CPDLC over the Atlantic. So that's the reason why we had to lock on earlier. In fact, if you don't have CPDLC, you will usually not be allowed into the North Atlantic high level airspace. You might be allowed to fly below it, so level 280 below, or above it, that is above flight level 410, so 430 and higher, but you're not going to be let into it. So it is requirement to have CPDLC on board. If you have it on the entry and it fails later on, then it's up to the pilot to decide whether it's best to continue or not. Personally, I would usually continue, of course. Now, this availability of CPDLC and the fact that we have done a cell call check, if the cell call check was positive, then we no longer need to monitor the ATC frequency, which is a really great relief for your ears. And if we don't monitor the ATC frequency, that means we have the radios available for different coverage. What are we going to do then? Well, you normally monitor the domestic frequency until you get out of range. Monitoring the domestic until you're out of range means you go after you did your check-in with Oceanic, after you have received your cell call check, you go back to the previous frequency 
and you're going to keep monitoring that until you're out of range. Once you get out of range, you are going to tune 1, 2, 3, decimal 4, 5. And 1, 2, 3, decimal 4, 5 is the air-to-air -air communications frequency. Now, normally you are going to hear lots of American pilots exchanging turbulence reports on that frequency. And that is certainly something that you might consider joining as well. If um, somebody is asking for a position near you, you can tell them if it's smoother, if it's turbulent, or if you are flying in turbulence, you can always ask aircraft ahead whether they experience turbulence. An example for that, let's say that we would have um, light turbulence now, would be, we're flying a nut track alpha, so we would ask something like, any aircraft on track alpha west of 20 degrees west, do you, res do you encounter turbulence? And then somebody might respond like, yeah, this, this is a uh, JetBlue 1015 and we're on track alpha at a 25 west light moderate turbulence in flight level 370. And then you're like, okay, thanks. Like that. You exchange turbulence information. And based on that, you might ask ATC for a level change or not. Now, asking ATC for level change is a good point now, because that is all done through CPDLC on um, the North Atlantic. So, you would go ATC, and uh, once you're locked on then, you could do things like request your uh, flight level, etc. So, for example, ATC, altitude request, and let's say that we want to uh, climb the flight level 400, you would go level 400, and uh, request that as an altitude right up here and then you could send that request. You can include some stuff like, for example, due to weather or due to aircraft performance. And that might turn out very handy. Because it might give your request a bit of additional emphasis. But in general, when you make that request, ATC is either going to grant it if it's by any means possible or not. Now, ATC might also send you messages asking like, when are you able for flight level 400? And then you can either tell them we can do it now or later or whatever. In any case, if you don't find a fitting response through CPDLC, you can always revert to voice procedures and just answer by voice. But whether you want to do that or not on an HF radio is completely up to you. Now, that much for vertical requests. Now let's talk about lateral requests. And over that, for that, we got the root request menu located right down here. And on here, direct to, forget it. You're not going to get those. If they can offer something, they will give it to you. But let's say you've got weather immediately ahead on your flight plan and you need to deviate. Then over Europe or in the States, it might be normal to deviate around weather using headings. On the North Atlantic, it's not. On the North Atlantic, you use that menu down here. Weather deviation up to so many miles left or right of track. So let's say weather deviation up to... 100 nautical miles to the right of track. It doesn't let me enter that, probably just wants the 100 without the R, so something like that. Weather deviation up to 100 miles offset. And um, you would also click the due to weather prompt down here if that's the case in order to emphasize that. Now, like that, you tell them I want so many miles left or right off track and then they are going to give to you whatever they can. When that clearance is received, Notice that it says up to so many miles. That means you can now fly anywhere between the center line of your route and 100 nautical miles, for example, to the right of it, depending on the clearance you get. And that means you can just use heading mode and navigate yourself through all those uh, weather phenomena, or you can just use um, LNAV to navigate along the um, given deviation. Now, finally, since we have already entered our North Atlantic, 10 minutes after you overfly the entry fix, note that it is 10 minutes, it used to be 30 in the past, but it's 10 now, you're going to squawk 2000. The reason you do that is because the ATC systems on the other side of the Atlantic might show you a different, or might have different aircraft allocated to the same squawk, and that would confuse the systems. For us, 10 minutes over the entry fix, squawk 2000. The only area where that does not apply is the so-called waters area. Waters means West Atlantic root system. Let's have a quick look into where that is. The West Atlantic root system is located inside the New York Oceanic area 
south of 45 degrees north, so south of 45 north, of 35 actually, my apologies. Let's see if we have it on the map. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we have it, but you can kind of see where the boundaries are located. And then west of 60 degrees west. So, as you can see, for example, here, that's where the um, Sorry waypoint is located. That's where you have a couple others down here. So, within that area over here is the West Atlantic route system. On that, you maintain your squawk. Usually, ATC in the real world is going to send you this squawk so-and-so, even though you have it already, several times when you're flying in there, in order to remind pilots to keep that squawk. Alrighty, so that's pretty much everything there is to it in order to fly safely on your VATSIM across the pond or on your typical VATSIM North Atlantic crossing. Now, one last thing over here. Position reports are not required to be done anymore. Position reports are fully automatic now and if ATC wants a position report they are going to request it from you through ADSC and your aircraft is automatically going to re respond to it. Unless an ATC directly tells you to give a position report, you don't need to do it. If you need to make a position report, however, there's an easy trick. The progress page in Boeing aircraft or the position report page that you can access through the progress page on Airbus aircraft is pretty much giving you the exact format you need. Now, with all of that, all I can say is, enjoy your Atlantic crossing. Be sure to do regular fuel checks whenever you overfly a waypoint. Check your time overhead and check your fuel. So that you can spot fuel leaks early in order not to become another air transit glider. And if you do nonetheless, I do hope you are flying an A330. That's a superb glider really. Alright, so that is basically going to conclude today's video. Rest assured, I did not go into too much detail over here. There would be a lot more to say about it. You might find a transatlantic livestream of myself at some point, in which I'm going to give more details as we have more time available. But with all of that said, all remains for me is enjoy your cross the pond, enjoy your North Atlantic crossings, and I'm really looking forward to see you all on the event. With that said, thank you very much everyone. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to leave a like in YouTube and comment to let me know what you think of it. And if you're up for more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Finally, if you really love what I'm doing, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. And with all of that out of the way, thank you very much. And I see you all again on the next one.